Alrighty, in this video I want to address a potential issue that we might run into later down the road, and I want to kind of get it sort of out of the way as soon as possible. And that is the concept of reserved IDs. Now if you're at all familiar with Photon, you'll know that when you send an operation to a uh, to the server or you receive an event from the server, uh, you have these event codes and operation codes that are just a single byte long. Now that's fine if you're doing a sort of switched based traditional uh, method of communication, but in this particular system I want to use the event code and the operation code as a component selector. So what I mean by that is the actual component that needs to receive a message will be in one byte, which will be the event ID, or sorry, the event code or the operation code, and then the method ID will be in another byte. I don't want to have it to where the operation codes will require that um, or prevent me from doing it this way. I want to be able to send codes to the client or to the server that aren't RPC messages. I want to be able to sort of add additional things on top of it, but if I'm already using up all potential values of the operation code, then how do I know if an, if an event or operation comes in, if it should be treated using the framework, uh, RPC framework, or if it should be using the uh, another sort of system. An example would be maybe movement. Um, maybe movement, when we get down to having some, uh, some actual movement in the game and we can start measuring the bandwidth implications of the system, uh, we might want to maybe plug it into something a little bit lower level than the component map and, and the systems framework. It depends on what we see down the road. But I don't want to have that be impossible to implement. And in this particular situation, it kind of is because the operation code byte is going to be used to select a component. So how would we be able to identify an operation that shouldn't be handled by the RPC framework um, or an operation that should be handled by the RPC framework? How do we distinguish between the two? Now we can add an extra byte, but that will add an extra byte. And it turns out that that there's a very simple way of doing this, actually, that I came up with that will give us the extensibility in the future to provide lower level events and lower level operations if the need ever arises. And that is the concept of reserved IDs. Now, basically, the idea is that in the component map constructor, I can pass in a byte or two bytes or actually, no, I just need one byte, wouldn't I? That would reserve a specific set of IDs for the purposes of whatever I want. So let's say um, for a special operation code or a special event code, reserve those IDs so that they don't get used and don't get generated. And this also plays into, in addition, automatically mapping components, which we'll take care of in this video as well. But the first thing I want to do is go ahead and make sure that I can instantiate a component map with a reserved byte ID range. So let's say if you passed in 3 into the component map, it would reserve 0, 1, and 2, those indices, that um, in such a way that they won't be able to have components mapped to them. And that'll give us flexibility in the future, like I said before, to add additional events and operations that don't get routed through the system. So on the other, that when we actually process an event, we can simply say, okay, if the byte ID is equal to or less than three, then that means it's a special operation and is not an operation that is going to be routed into the RPC framework. So it's just a way to give us some little more flexibility, even though that we might not be needing it uh, in the near future. Um, we will be able to start playing around with this when we get to actually uh, tuning the performance of our movement system. So anyway, what I'm going to do is in this constructor, I'm going to pass in a byte reserved component ID limit. And I'm going to go ahead and make it a automatic property. So you'll notice that a property just appeared here, and I'm going to set it to a private set. So now we have a reserved component ID limit up here, which specifies the IDs that can be used. Uh, in addition, I'm also going to write a new constructor. I'm going to say public component map. And this constructor is simply going to invoke the, uh, the parameterized constructor with zero. Uh, 
indicating that we're not intending to reserve any component IDs. So then once we have this done, uh, I can come up here to the map component method and I can add a check to ensure that the component we're trying to map doesn't violate the reserved IDs that we established in the instantiation of the component map. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say um, I'm going to say something like, so let's just uh, work this out. I, I don't want to run into another off by one error, so let's just uh, think about this for a second. If we pass in 3 into the reserved component ID limit, that means we're reserving 0, 1, and 2, which means that the component ID is going to have to be less than the reserved component ID limit. And the opposite of that would be the component ID is going to be have to be greater or equal to uh, the other one. So if I say if component ID is less than the reserved component ID limit, that means we've hit that limit and we need to throw an exception. So I'm going to throw a new argument exception and I'm going to say um, ID passes reserved component ID limit. And then I'm going to pass in component ID. Anyway, so let's go ahead and make sure this works. Uh, real fast. Uh, this should only take a second. I'm going to hop down here into my tests project, open up base, go into my component map tests. Now you'll notice that none of my other tests got impacted because I did provide this um, this zero or this initialization right here, this default constructor. Uh, I could I could go ahead and actually just as a sanity check ensure that I didn't mess anything up by running all my existing tests but they really should pass. Unless I got something backwards. Okay, yeah, they passed. All right, so let's go ahead and um, create a new test. So I'm gonna say test, I'm gonna say public void. Um, um, reserved component ID limit uh, prevents components from being mapped, uh, whatever. Okay, then I'm going to say var map equals new component map, and I'm going to pass in a reserved component ID limit of three. Then I'm going to write a handful of actions. I'm going to say action action one equals map dot map component type of I test component. Uh, let's try to map it to zero, and then let's try to map it to one, and then let's try to map it to two. Then I'm going to say action one should throw argument exception. Action two should throw argument exception. Action three should throw argument exception. And then finally, I'm going to say map dot map component uh, type of I test component. And then I'm going to pass in three because three should work. Um, so basically, if you're wondering um, what am I, you know, acting and asserting here? Right here, I'm kind of, I'm kind of combining the two concepts, sort of. It gets a little murky, but I am intending this code to be a an assert. By running this code at the end, if it throws an exception, that means there's a problem, and if an exception gets thrown into test, the test will fail by definition. So having this code, this test written in such a way, should indeed validate that at least when I set the reserved ID to three, that it will work properly. Anyway, so let's go ahead and run this test, make sure that we get those exceptions thrown, and they do. So we have now reserved a particular set of IDs. Now this feature isn't just really about the ability to manually map components. Actually, the reason why I wanted to write this feature in particular was the concept of auto mapping components. I want to ha have the ability to tell the mapper to map a type and have that mapper identify the ID that it wants by using uh, just a basic integer that will be incremented, and then also loop through all of the methods of that component and automatically map them. Because I don't want to have to do this manually, that would just be a pain. So I want to write a auto map component method, and an auto map assembly method, and then an auto map app domain method. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to go ahead and just write a test out. And I'm going to scroll up to the top to see if there are... Actually, I'm just going to go ahead and write a new interface. I'm going to say interface I test component 4. I'm just going to copy the definition here that we have on I test component 3. 
I'm also going to do something a little bit interesting, um, and this is a little bit of foresight that I have when working with automatically mapping components, is how do you know when you scan an assembly which component should be mapped and which component should be ignored? Well, it's actually going to be kind of diff. I mean, it's well, it's not difficult, but we would have a couple options. We could do things by convention. Maybe if a certain component is sitting in a particular namespace or has a particular suffix or whatever, we could decide that okay, this type needs to be mapped as a component. Or what I prefer to do is I prefer to annotate the types with attributes. And by annotating the types with the attributes, it allows me to. Uh, not have to worry about matching up with some particular convention or location for a component. It also makes things a lot clearer. So what I want to do is when we get to the auto map assembly method, I want it to have a uh, parameter that it, that you pass into it that determines which uh, attribute to look for to select out components. Uh, I could write one with a, let's say, a predicate as well, but I think I'll just simplify things and uh, do things with components. You guys could write a version that accepts a predicate as well if you want. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say uh, class test auto map assembly attribute. attribute. And then I'm not going to worry about annotating it. And then I'm going to go ahead and apply that attribute to my iTest component 4. Now this is going to be irrelevant up until we start talking about auto mapping assemblies, but I wanted to, since we're already up here at the top of the file, wanted to get that little bit out of the way so that uh, when we get to auto mapping assemblies we don't have to hop all around the file. So anyway, so we just have this uh, test component 4, we have a test auto map assembly attribute. Now let's scroll all the way to the bottom and let's, uh, let's write a new test method. And so the, the test method is going to have an auto map assembly, uh, or no, auto map uh, component call to it, which is a method that doesn't exist yet, but we'll write against the component map assuming that it does, or pretending that it does rather. All right, so I'm going to say public void can auto map component. So I'm going to say var map equals new component map. I'm going to use the default constructor here. Um, I'll test reserved IDs in another test. Then I'm going to say map dot auto map component. And then I'm going to pass in type of I test component four. All right, so what's the behavior that I'm looking for here? Well, first of all, when I invoke map to auto map component, uh, I want it to generate a new ID and I want those IDs to be sequential. Um, so we want to generate sequential IDs here. So the first component that will be mapped will be at ID 0. So now we can say map dot components at 0 dot type should be type of I test component 3, or sorry, I test component 4. In addition to that, we also have to ensure that the methods get mapped. So what I'm going to do is to say map components 0, um, methods 0 should be type of, actually there's a, probably an easier way to test this, uh, method 0 dot name, or sorry, method info dot name should be, and then let's go ahead and uh, just remind ourselves really quickly what I named those methods. So we should have a void method no params method. And then we should also have a method at 1 and a method at 2. And the second one should be void method 1 param and void method 2 params. And I totally just, uh, no, that's good. All right, so basically all that happens is we have a map, we auto map a component, and we should get a component at ID 0 with three methods on it. Now this test won't even compile yet because of course we don't have the auto map component method. Fortunately though that method is pretty straightforward to write. So I'm going to jump back into component map and I'm going to write an auto map method method or auto map component method. So I'll say public mapped component auto map component and then I'm going to say type component type. And so now what I'm going to do is the first thing I need to do is establish the ID that we want this uh, particular component to be, which will require an additional private field on our component map. So I'm going to say private byte next component ID. 
or how about next auto mapped component ID. Then on this constructor, because this constructor is invoked uh, both times, it's convoked by the parameterless constructor as well as, well, itself obviously. And then at the bottom of this, I'm just going to say next auto mapped component ID equals zero. And that's despite the fact that, yes, I know it'll be automatically initialized to zero, but I still really like to make sure that I initialize all of my fields. Um, I guess that just is a holdover from uh, me writing in C++. So anyway, it's a good habit to get in anyway. All right, so auto map component. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to say var mapped component equals map component passing in the component type, and then next auto mapped component ID. Then I'm going to say next auto map component ID plus plus. Now you might be wondering why I didn't put a plus plus right here. I could have, and maybe I would have if I was in a different mood. I mean, it's just something whether or not I add a increment in line in a method invocation or add an increment on another line is really I switch between the two frequently but an argument could be made for either in this particular case I want this code to be very clear and to make code very clear it's good I it's a good idea not to have a bunch of uh, increments inside of method invocations anyway so now that we've mapped the component we actually have to map all the methods on that component so there's a couple ways of doing this. I could put this behavior inside of the auto map component, and I think I will. I, I think I'm not going to worry about putting the behavior uh, of mapping the compo automatically mapping a component into the actual mapped component class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for each var method. Well, actually, that's going to be a slightly problematic, isn't it? Because I'll need a internal ID to know what the next method ID should be. So I think I will do that. I think I'm going to say mapped component dot auto map methods and then I'm going to return mapped component. So I think I will have that be stored on the actual mapped component um, itself so that I have that uh, that counter to know when the next ID of the method comes up in there. Okay, so uh, mapped component blah blah blah, that looks all good. Now let's go ahead and jump into our mapped component class and I'm going to say public void auto map methods. Now the auto map methods, just like our auto map component, is going to require some sort of counter to know when we uh, what ID to use next. So I'm going to come up here and say private byte next. Uh, what did I call this one? Uh, next auto map component ID. So I'll say next auto mapped method ID. And I'll initialize that to zero. Uh, other people might be asking why I don't do this instead of initializing in the constructor. And the reason is, with the exception of a very, a very, very few cases, I vastly prefer to put my initialization in constructors and not in field initializers. Uh, there's there are a couple good reasons to do this as far as concrete reasons to do this. In particular, the order in which field initializers get um, well, invoked compared to the order in which constructors get invoked in inheritance situations is actually opposite, meaning you can run into some really bizarre behavior while using field initializers with inheritance and multiple constructors at multiple levels. Uh, another reason is I really, really dislike the idea of any sort of executable code living inside what I consider to be the definition of the class and not the implementation. I would consider the implementation of the class to be within uh, methods, constructors, and properties, whereas the definition of the class is going to be things like method signatures, property signatures, and fields. So I really just dislike putting executable code anywhere that isn't in explicitly within the bounds of a method or a property, because methods and properties are where executable code should live, period. So. I will um, use field initializers on occasion, depending on certain scenarios, but by default I will not. I find it's more explicit, it prevents really difficult to de uh, debug issues, and it just looks cleaner in my opinion. Anyway, so now that we've done that, uh, we can now access the next auto mapped method ID. So what I can do is I can say for each var method in type get methods, and then I'm going to pass in some binding flags. I'm going to say binding flags instance, 
binding flags public. And that'll just ensure that we only get the public instance methods of this particular component. Okay, so we're looping through each one of these methods. For each one of these methods, I'm going to say map method method next auto map method ID next auto math mapped method ID plus plus. And that really should be it as far as ma automatically mapping a method. And that should complete our component map implementation here because now that's, this compiles. And that should make our test compile as well. So now that our test is compiling, let's go ahead and run it and see what we get. We get success. So we did indeed auto map a component without having to explicitly map each one of the methods and so on. So now I want to combine these two last tests with something. I want to go ahead and say, I'll say test public void auto mapping component respects reserved IDs. So var map equals new component map. And then I'm going to pass in reserved component ID limit three. Then I'm going to say map dot auto map component type of I test component for. Now what I'm going to do is I'm saying map dot components at zero should be null. Map dot components at one should be null. Map components at two should be null, and that'll give us three reserved IDs. Now what I want to do is basically I'm just going to copy this and I'm just going to paste it right here. And then I'm going to change the IDs to three. So now we're testing to ensure that the third uh, component is indeed properly auto mapping. So now let's go ahead and see if this works, which it will not work actually. The reason it won't work is we haven't done anything to our next component ID. It's a really simple fix though. Jumping back into component map, we can scroll all the way up here and we can see next auto map component ID. Now let's go ahead and set it to the same thing as reserved component ID limit because that happens to correspond with the first valid ID or what I would consider to be the first valid ID given that the uh, consumer of this class requested that the first three components be reserved for those IDs to be used um, in other scenarios. So let's go ahead and run our tests and see what happens. Now we get auto mapping. Um, yeah, so that works. All right, so uh, we've already added a couple really great features to our component map, but there's a couple more things I want to do. I want to have a auto map assembly and I want to have an auto map app domain. And so they'll actually be built on each other. Uh, I won't be able to test, well, I guess I, eh. Testing the auto map, uh, auto map app domain will be a bit of a pain. I don't think I'm going to worry too much about it. The auto map assembly should be pretty straightforward to test, however. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and write another interface, interface I test component 5. I'm going to say test auto map assembly. And then let's, let's add another one, uh, 6. OK, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to tell the component map to automatically map all types in this assembly that have the test auto map assembly attribute applied to them. So I'm going to scroll down all the way to the bottom. or right, right here, and I'm going to say test public void auto mapping assembly auto <laughs> auto maps assembly. Sure, why not? It's a really dumb test name, but it should get its uh, intent across. So I'm going to say var map equals new component map. So what am I looking for here? Well, I want to be able to say map dot auto map assembly. Then I want to pass in type of uh, well, actually, let's first pass in the assembly. How do we get the current assembly in .NET? We want a, a reference to this, uh, the system reflection assembly type, which describes the assembly uh, that contains all of your classes. Or, well, it contains all the modules, and the modules contain all the classes, or all the types. Well, the easiest way that I find to do it is to not use assembly 
um, which this will bring in a using statement up at the top, uh, system.reflection. Do I don't use assembly dot um, get calling assembly or entry assembly or executing assembly. Instead, what I do is I like to do a type of and then the enclosing class, which is going to be component map tests. Then I want to do dot assembly. The reason I do this is because the assembly that a particular application is executing under can actually change uh, depending on what's going on. It's actually possible for certain scenarios to cause the current assembly to be different than what you had expected it to be, particularly in dot, or ASP.NET, because uh, what happens is there's a level of inheritance involved, and then when you're trying to get the current assembly, it's actually a different assembly than what you would expect it to be. So what I always do whenever I need to establish an assembly is I grab a concrete reference to a type that I know is in the assembly that I want and then use its dot assembly to access it. So I don't have to worry about any sort of the weird little different things that might happen over the course of a runtime changing what the current assembly might be. So this I can ensure would be rock solid regardless of what's happening in the runtime. Anyway, so the automap assembly, the first parameter is going to be an assembly, which we already have that supplied with this argument. The second parameter is going to be a type, and that type is going to be the attribute that we wanted to select based off of. So we want it to map every single component in this assembly that is annotated with this particular attribute. After that, I want to basically do map dot get component type of I test component for should not be or should not be null and then I also want to do it for 5 and 6 so I want to ensure that components 4, 5, and 6 were mapped and just for um, just for sanity's sake I want to say map um, I want to go action um, fail equals map get component type of I test component just I test component. Remember, I test components used in some of the earlier tests, but it's not annotated with that attribute, meaning it should not be mapped. Meaning that invoking that should throw an exception. I can't remember exactly what it is. It's probably a key not found exception, but I'm just going to uh, test it against the exception base class. Okay, so this should fail because this component should not be mapped, whereas these three components should be mapped. Now, we don't have to test the methods inside of those mapped assemblies because of these two tests we're fairly certain that the methods will be mapped appropriately and we don't want to uh, test too many things in one test. Anyway so let's go ahead and jump over into the component map and let's write the auto map assembly. So I'm going to say public uh, void this time auto map assembly assembly which will require I bring in system.reflection assembly to map and then type um, attribute selector. Okay, so this method is going to be pretty straightforward. For each var type in assembly to map dot get types if type dot get custom attributes attribute selector comma false dot any, uh, this will bring in using system.link at the top, then auto map component type. Now I know that I could combine these into, into a where, I don't want to do that. I find that anything but the simplest where clause inside of the second half of a for each loop adds a little bit too much, compl uh, not complexity, but a little bit, uh, makes it a little bit too difficult to read in my opinion. So I like breaking it out into an explicit if, um, uh, if that works as well. Anyway, so now that I have this, let's jump back into mapped comp or our component map tests and let's run this guy and see what happens. So we get success. So all of these work. All right, so the next thing I want to do, the final thing I want to do is something I'm not going to worry about testing. I'm going to say public void 
auto map current app domain. And I'm going to simply say for each var assembly in app domain dot current domain dot get assemblies map assembly assembly. Anyway, it's interesting because with this code right here, you can actually see the hierarchy of the way .NET handles uh, uh, code. Uh, we have the the app domain, which is the most oh derp to derp. That's what I get for not writing a test. I actually forgot to uh, do that. All right. Anyway, so we can see the hierarchy of the way .NET works. Uh, we have our app domain, which our app domain contains. Um, uh, although you can have multiple app domains per process, we're not going to worry about doing that. Uh, so the app domain contains all of your executable code, pretty much, unless you have multiple per process. Then you have assemblies, which uh, app domains are made up of assemblies. And then you have components, because types are assemblies are made up of types. And then you have methods, because in effect, types are made up of methods and a couple other extra things. All right. So I think this pretty much gets the um, component map to where it needs to be. I don't see any more features that need to be added to this to support the um, features that we will need to depend on when we write the RPC framework. Uh, the next thing that we're going to take a look at is saving and loading the component map. We'll need a way to uh, serialize and deserialize the component map so that we can send it over the wire. Um, I'll talk about the justifications for that in the next video. Anyway, we'll see you guys next time.